Hello, you're very welcome to All In, our brand new business show here on Joe, backed by AIB. Each week we'll be getting up close and personal with business news and trends in the company of some of Ireland's most savvy and successful business people. This week we'll be looking at scaling, the when, the why and the how to. And here to discuss in studio we have Maximum Media founder Niall McGarry, who built Ireland's most successful independently owned digital media company and then scaled it up into the UK to do it all over again. And VC veteran Brian Caulfield, whose startups tend to sell for anything up to 50 million at a time. And our all in trailblazer Richard Barnwell is the man behind a video game currently trailblazing its way across the industry. He's here to talk to us about Star Trek Fleet Command and the fact that he's just been acquired. That's in just a few moments, but first, if you haven't already, hit subscribe to get the full show on podcast on YouTube. You can, of course, find us on Twitter, where the username is at allin underscore business. We're on LinkedIn too, and of course, you can contact us at any time on any platform with the hashtag allinbusiness. Joe presents All In, together with AIB, backing Irish business. So Brian and Niall, thank you very much for joining us. And I suppose in any conversation about scaling, there are a few big questions we need to cover. We need to cover the why, we need to cover the how, we need to cover the when. So I'm going to start with the why. Why should any business scale or why should a business not scale, I suppose, might be the more interesting question. Well, I think the first thing I'd say about that is absolutely not every business should scale. And I think there's a couple of things. You know, the first thing is, do you actually have a scalable business model? Because if you don't, then an attempt to scale is kind of doomed to failure. But you also need to think about what do the founders and the owners of the business want to get out of it. And I think we've got a bit of an obsession with scaling that's sometimes unhealthy. You know, if if you've got a business that generates a couple of million of revenue a year and you're making a half a million profit and you're giving 10 people great jobs, then that's a fantastic business to own. And if that's what your, you know, what your ambition for the business is, you should be very proud of that business and you shouldn't feel compelled to scale it just because the world is telling you that you should. Mm, what do you think about that now? Why, yeah, why I, should someone scale? I would agree. Well, look, I mean, again, why should okay? Why should someone scale? Because obviously they've got business idea X and they think they can take over the world, right? I mean, at, at the end of the day, every entrepreneur has to have a dream and has to have an ambition. As Brian rightly said, you know, we we've got to a point where we there's this obsession culture been created around scaling and around taking over the world. And like, what I would say is that we've lost the sense of building a business at X point, taking it to Y, and then taking it beyond that and beyond that and beyond that at different stages. We've kind of created this scenario where we have to go from here to taking over the world by the end of next week. And if we haven't, we've, we're not the big new unicorn or we're not the big new exciting thing. So we've kind of lost the run of ourselves a little bit. A lot of it has come from Silicon Valley and that kind of venture capitalist culture of, you know, things. one of the things with venture capitalism is obviously, you know, they're set up to back 10 businesses on the basis that, and again, Brian will know this better, eight will fail and the two that work make them huge amounts of money. So it's not necessarily a great playbook for every aspiring entrepreneur to go to because if do you want to be in that 80% that don't necessarily work? So I think there's a happy medium to be found and a different, it all depends on what the idea is, the nugget of the idea and how scalable it is. But as Brian rightly alluded to, there's lots of great ideas and great businesses that can be started that can create employment, can give entrepreneurs a really good standard of living that don't necessarily have to be in 80 countries in the first 52 weeks of their business. And in terms of if you do decide... You've got the why of it, then comes the when of it. So obviously there's a difference between um, a startup trying to scale in that you know one or two year period, as you mentioned, and then the opportunistic side where maybe you're trundling along, uh, happy out, you're six, seven years in, and then uh, some particular set of circumstances arises that gives you a chance to have a really good shot at scaling. Um, when should someone scale? Is there even a way to know when to scale? Well, to me, there absolutely is a, a way to know when is the right time. I mean, the first thing is you obviously have to have a product that works and that that that, that people like, that, you, that your customers like. I mean, that's an absolute prerequisite. But beyond that, the key thing for me is... Do you understand the connection between your sales and marketing spending and revenue? And if you don't, 
it's too early to scale. The quickest way to kill a company is by investing in sales and marketing when you really don't know what works from a sales and marketing perspective. So that's the thing that I'm always looking for in a business. Do you know that if we hire, you know, 10 more salespeople, that we have the playbook that is going to enable them to deliver revenue uh, as expected. And if you don't have that, uh, I'd caution against kind of premature scaling. And if you're, from a VC point of view, looking at that from the outside in, uh, not to talk us round in circles, but can you see whether they know when is the right time to do it or whether they have that equation that you just mentioned there with sales and marketing, whether they have, have that right? Well, I mean, I, I, I think there's a little bit of a, a sort of a sense that VCs are omnipotent and, and all-seeing. And, and, of course, that's totally untrue, you know. You, you, you put a lot of emphasis on trying to figure that out. Mm. And for certain types of businesses, there, there are things that you can kind of look at in terms of the finances of the business. You know, you can look in, let's say, an internet SaaS business at where whether they've been successfully growing revenues kind of on a month-on-month -month basis and how much are they investing in sales and marketing to actually achieve that revenue growth, you know. Mm -hmm. And ideally what you'd like to see is that the cost of the revenue growth is declining as they refine their, uh, their, their processes, you know. But uh, a lot of it is judgment, you know. A lot, a lot of things in business are just judgment. They can't be reduced to uh, a simple equation, sadly. If it was that easy, everybody would be yeah. doing it. I, I think a couple of the key indicators for businesses, for, we'll say, medium-sized businesses in Ireland that are looking to maybe scale into international markets with some of the opportunities that Brexit presents itself is that are they posting strongly profitable EBITDA numbers on a fairly consistent basis? And even if they're, even if they're not, if they take a loss one year, are they back into positive EBITDA in the next year? So, like, there's lots of ways of like, have I got the, have I put in, have I enough oil, have I put enough fuel in the tank to mm. be able to go and take this? Obviously, then it's crucial to see if does this opportunity that works in Ireland work in other markets? Because one of the things we're absolutely limited by is that Ireland is a small market. The, way, uh, the big advantage is it's easy to become famous. Like every brand needs to become famous in the sense of if you're trying to build a brand, you've got to become famous first in order to then see will people buy on a continual basis your product or service. And Ireland is an easy enough market to do that in because it's four or five million people, very digitally savvy, relatively connected. So there's obvious advantages starting in Ireland. I think it's a great, it's a great test market, Ireland. But obviously, when people are building their business for that big exit, so some people are, and again, it's down to what type of entrepreneurs they are. And one of the things we're guilty of is assuming all entrepreneurs are cut the exact same way. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to Brian's piece, that two million turnover, making half, creating uh, 10 jobs, that's, that's one type, it's not one level, not necessarily that's Lionel Messi and this is their guys playing in Division 2 in England. This, this is different appetites that people mm -hmm. have, okay? Yep. But if you're in Ireland and you want to scale, you want to go into lots of different markets, Ireland is a very, very good test market. But if you want that big payday and you want that multiple, and Brian will know this better than I will, if you want to get that big payout and build this big you know, empire and, and, and exit at some stage successfully, the multiples are going to be stronger in markets that are far bigger. Mm. Because a lot of the time, the multiples are linked to how big you've become in the market. So if you've become very big in a small market, a lot of people look at you and go, okay, they're a good, strong, solid business, but ultimately there's not much growth left in that market. If you're a fast growing player in a much bigger market, your multiples are significantly higher because the potential new suitor for that business thinks, if I take this over, we could explode it and we could absolutely own the market. So that's a big thing when it comes to scale is that if your thing is exit, Mm -hmm. I would obviously, and you want to have that, and that's why you're going into business, I would obviously have the, we need to get into different markets as so a fundamental. So tell us about, in practice, what you've just spoken about in theory there. So obviously, you went from one market, Ireland, brand recognition, <laughs> uh, yeah. achieved all that, and then you decided to go into the UK, and you decided to do it VC-less. So tell us about yeah. that choice and that, the, the scaling involved there. Yeah, well, at the time, around 2014, we had Joe and her, and I kind of, obviously, I'd come from the rubble of, Celtic Tiger crash, you know, I'm running a business young in my 20s in the midst of all that anarchy. And 2011 was probably the lowest ebb in my life in terms of, and we'd started Joe in terms of Joe was only just starting to take off, but like still the entire country was massively struggling. And then by 2014 to be in a scenario where all of a sudden we had probably built the business that Brian t t t touched on there where 
I, you know, we were doing maybe two or three million turnover, we were making a nice EBITDA, and we were employing lots of people. And it all of a sudden seemed, I had, I had room in the tank to go and do something new. So I had looked at the food space, mm. and I had looked at, before protein bars were in every single shelf in Ireland, I had looked at doing a kind of a paleo meal version in all different supermarkets in Ireland with an opportunity to scale. And I just backed away from that idea because I didn't know enough about retail. So it was like, right, let's just stick to what I know and let's go at the UK. But when I was making that decision, I needed to believe, and again, I'm just, that's who I am. I needed to believe that it wouldn't suck up five days of my life over in London because that's not what I absolutely wanted. Mm. So we were in a position where we were able to get over there, get on the ground. One of the huge advantages of operating a business in London is that there's a wealth of talent. We are facing in Ireland a major skill shortage, particularly in a city the size of Dublin, because all the big uh, foreign multinationals that are in Dublin, the Facebooks, the Googles, the LinkedIn's, etc., are hoovering up a lot of talent. So the great advantage of going over to the UK is when we get in and I get the foundations due, I can bring in a level of individual who can now scale the business up. Now, we've worked hard to find the right people here in Ireland, but they're far more plentiful in the UK. Mm. So you then can get to a situation where you can you know, scale your business without necessarily being there. So I'm only there maybe two days, three days a week. Well, two, two days a week, maybe some cases every second week. But it, that was down to the basis of finding the individual. But it was a long journey, and I had to really consider that. And to do it without, yeah, probably private equity would have been the stage we were at was definitely what I want to do because ultimately I want to retain ownership for a period, a significant period mm -hmm. of time. Some people obviously go down the VC route and they're happy that at the you know within three years they're going to own maybe very little, but that's fine because if you build a big operation and you own ten percent of something huge and that's probably worth more than hundred percent of something small. But for me, it was always about being in control, and it's not to be obsessive about control. It was that I had a very clear vision for where media was going. And I wanted to execute that plan. So one of the so one of the challenges of taking a partner on board at that stage in a mm -hmm. VC or PE capacity would be would external influences who thought they knew it mm. influence our ability to make decisions. And being nimble and agile in media in the current landscape is vital because all of the big media organisations around the world are being challenged by being too slow to make decisions. So to answer your question, it was the right time. I had time, crucially. So if we go back to if the entrepreneur is flat out in their current business and they haven't got time to get their head up, then they should not be thinking of scaling because mm -hmm. that's just biting off way more than you can chew. I had actually the time and the space to think about what we wanted to do and it was only a matter of making the decision and cracking the UK market and we might talk a bit later on the show. It was just a wide open opportunity for us. Sure. And um, Brian, I'm going to bring you in there just in, if you don't mind in terms of uh, what Niall touched on there. He had the time, he had the scope, he had the mental capacity. I'd imagine many other people don't maybe think they do bite off more than they can chew. Yeah. You must have seen that a lot. Yeah, 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 I've seen that frequently. Actually, I think there was two really great points in what Niall was was saying there that are kind of worth uh, worth reflecting on and worth worth pulling out. The first is the point around, you know, how do you actually make money in business? And I think there's fundamentally two ways to make money as a founder of a business. You can either own the vast majority of the equity in something that might be relatively small, but you own a very, very big stake in it, or you can own a small stake in something that's very big. Mm. Now, typically, in order to make that model work, you need access to essentially a huge amount of capital to grow uh, to grow the business. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, you don't need that capital and you need to be able to operate on an EBITDA positive uh, basis. The thing that doesn't work is when you're in the middle mm. where you don't have the capital and you still have a small equity stake and that's just never going to work. The other thing that Niall touched on was the issue of management, and this mm -hmm. kind of goes back to your original question. Um, I think one of the big challenges with scaling a business is that you're probably going to have to upgrade your management team reasonably significantly. And Niall mentioned that he you know, was able to find the right person in London to help with the scaling. Uh, that's that's just so important, and I think one of the big challenges that people face when they uh, when they start to scale a business is they start to find out that you know, for example, maybe the person who is running sales is very good at selling 
but is perhaps not good at structuring and organizing an international sales team. And you may have to make some pretty hard calls about the upgrade of your management team at that stage. So I think that's, that, that, that's one of the big challenges. And have you found that, Niall, without naming names, obviously? Have you been in that situation where you've had to Yeah, no, we didn't really get it right calls. in the UK. We yeah. had to roll the dice a few times, and that's and you're, you're, you're waiting to find the six, and then eventually you, you can find them. And as I said, the big advantage we had in the UK was that there is genuinely... Sorry, in London, in London, let's just kind of stop looking at London as the capital of England. Mm. It's it's just global hub, right? There's people from all around the world. There is just an oasis of talent. And that's why I'm always excited when the guys are looking, we need to hire this person. I'm like, well... You have it easy because you're just picking off 15 million people are there, there about in that region from all over the world, and it's just you know unbelievably talented. So yes, we didn't def- we definitely didn't get it right. And as Brian alluded to, if you don't get it right with the personnel, then your business isn't isn't going to work, and you're going to have to sometimes rip out the heart of what you've half built and go again mm-hmm. and go again. So iterations of team, and that that can lead to challenges because obviously then that can be a kind of a cultural challenge where you're ripping out a team that you've put in and you are a senior element of the team and then you have to go again. But you're, you're doing it with the longer term view of we're going to be far better off. And ultimately, the culture isn't going to ever be right under this current kind of regime because these individuals can't take us to the level we need to get to. Rip off the band-aid. So, yeah, mm-hmm. well, yeah. And it, and it is a challenge and it is difficult. And it then means that, you know, you're never, you can't expect to always be everybody's best friend in business mm-hmm. because... Um, because you have to make those difficult choices. And the entrepreneur needs to realise that. I remember when I go back to my first business in Impact Media, when I set up just after I finished college, I was one of the youngest people working there. We'd grown to about 20 people. And in the middle of Celtic Tiger Ireland, I had to get in and give three rounds of pay cuts. I didn't want to get rid of anyone. But I went from being everyone's friend to the boss very, very clearly. And then within that journey, I just held on to that mantle of I am the boss and I am... That, that comes with negative connotations and it's something that you mm. you you have to always consider. But if you treat people as fairly as you can. Everyone has to understand there's that classic phrase of it's just business. Mm. As long as you're not being you know, ruthless for the sake of it, then you will have to make tough decisions and you have to embrace that. But scale and opportunity for me is, is twofold. There's medium businesses that can take it to the next level. And of Ireland, I feel there's a lot and I feel Brexit is going to present some exciting opportunities. And everyone does look at Ireland right now in a very, globally, in a very positive frame of mind. We have become this shining Beacon. Now, one of the challenges, obviously, we're, we're so reliant on foreign direct investment, and that's what makes us nice and shiny because we've got an educated workforce. That, that has created a scenario where the, where the Irish government haven't done enough to support Irish indigenous business, and I, I feel like there's a lot of work that's needed there. Um, if you look at, and I've gone off on a tangent slightly, but if you look at why are all these foreign direct investment companies in Ireland, it's because of low corporation tax. <coughs> so a lot of people say to us, why couldn't we create jobs in Castlebar, where I'm from, or Galway, or Cork? And I'd be like, we need tax breaks to go to those regions. Why can't we look at it as a scenario where an Irish business... Because one of the huge challenges, right, and this hasn't been spoken about, there's a lot of Irish businesses in Ireland that are national businesses that are operating in an EMEA-headquartered city. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that the workforce, in terms of what they can command, has gone through the roof because there's huge EMEA and global headquarters here in Dublin. It means rents and rates accordingly will follow suit certain parts of the city that we just couldn't get into because they're just blocked out because and so there is great things in having all of these companies in Ireland because ultimately they create great employment but there's massive downsides and I feel like the government have to do an awful lot of work on how we help support Irish indigenous business in Dublin that's servicing the country Mm -hmm. because that hasn't been spoken about at all so we won't even get to whether rents have been pushed up and all that stuff that's an obvious challenge in terms of accommodation but from a business perspective, the Irish, Irish government, or gov- successive governments, have to start now breaking down businesses and offering different levels of advice or opportunities or um, breaks or initiatives for different levels of business. Because at the moment, we're paying the same corporation tax as these companies that are turning multi, uh, multi-billions across the world. Mm. And we're kind of still doing well in, in the Irish market, but there's other businesses that are servicing the national interest to, to be to be based in Dublin as, as, a, as, a, as an operation in an operation capacity yet they're they're competing now for staff and in rental markets with huge conglomerates and nothing has been done to challenge that and address that so 
an off and a slight tangent there, but it's kind of almost like the inverted scaling. It's like well, let's stick with it, Brian. What do you think about that? Is Ireland a good place right now to scale a business if um, you're indigenous? It, it's it's actually a pretty tough place to scale a business if you're an indigenous enterprise. And you know, to be honest, this is another great great point, and it's definitely if you like uh, singing my song. Um, you know, I I think if we want to spread prosperity in Ireland, right around the country, then we desperately need to enable our indigenous entrepreneurs to scale their businesses here. You know, a foreign, a multinational company coming to Ireland to establish its EMEA headquarters is not going to put it in Thurles or Castlebar or wherever it might be. You know, they're going to put it in Dublin because it's convenient for flights for senior execs and all that kind of thing. They might at a stretch put it in Cork or Galway, but they're extremely unlikely to put it in a, a very small Irish, a small Irish town. On the other hand, you have great entrepreneurial businesses now being established in in smaller Irish towns. You know, I think of Near Form in Tremor. They've got 140 people around the world, 40 in Tremor. The balance of the people are largely remote, in fact. That's something that's enabled by modern technology. But 40 people in Tremor with really good, well-paid jobs has an absolutely huge, uh, huge impact. And there are other examples. You know, Mike Webster's company, Arvaya, in, uh, in Killarney, there are up to 50 people there. Those businesses have an incredible impact. And... We need much, much more of them. You yeah, know? because those businesses then have founders and entrepreneurs behind them that are based from that region and want are proud to have that business in that region. Yeah. The the downside to foreign direct investment is Dell can make a decision to decide to rip out their plant in Limerick and move it to Poland, and Limerick has not recovered since. Mm. So that is something that we as an industry and a nation have to wake up to, is that if we don't... There's just more that needs to be done. There's just far more that needs to be done because ultimately we can't be in a situation where the, heart, the hearts of towns or cities can get ripped out by someone, someone in San Francisco making a decision on our behalf. The only way to countenance that or to counter it is to actually then create more here locally. But it's a, but it's a big challenge. But at the moment, if you're a startup business and you're in Galway or you're in Killarney or you're in wherever, you are paying the exact... You, you've, you, have, you don't really have an incentive that differentiates you from Facebook or Google operating here in Ireland. And as I said, I am positive to have Google and Facebook here, but at the same time, we need to create a new rule book for people who have to compete in the exact same market because you're paying the exact same levels of employers per SI if you're a 10-person operation in Galway as you know, a huge industry here in Dublin that has a global uh, and is backed by American money. Like that, that is not set up for success in the longer term. Mm -hmm. So there hasn't been any imagination done on help, uh, created on helping people scale some of these businesses, even go to scale from Dublin, sorry, from Galway to Dublin or from Donegal to Dublin. That might be the first stage of scaling. There's not been enough done. And like Enterprise Ireland, fine operation and all that, but that, that's, that's set up just purely for kind of exporting, really. A lot of the time, businesses that don't have an export plan, they, they, won't, they won't look at you. So, so straight away, you're kind of suggesting to the entrepreneur, the only opportunity you have in Donegal is to get to Doha, rather than Dublin, because we're not going to back it otherwise. So there's lots that needs to be done. So I would definitely take umbrage with Ireland is the best little country to do business in. It has a huge amount of advantages for foreign direct investment. It has nowhere near enough for entrepreneurs on the ground here. Last point to make, sorry, on that is just even if you look at entrepreneurs' relief, right? And again, if you do well in business and you're fortunate enough to build a business and be able to access entrepreneurs, we have a lot of people who say, well done you. So on the, at a moment in Ireland, if you sell your business for two million quid on the first million, you'll pay a 10% tax. Uh, and in the UK, you can sell it for whatever, and on the first 10 million, you'll pay 10% um, tax. So straight away, you, you... So this isn't about saying entrepreneurs should pay less tax. It's that it's proven that entrepreneurs will put that money back in, create more business and more jobs. And you can't have entrepreneurs getting the same level of credence as someone who buys a house 
rents it out at exorbitant rates, then sells it and it pays the exact same level of capital gains tax. Like, so there's so many fundamental elements to the taxation structure that could be improved to create more jobs and create more employment. But then we scratch our heads and wonder why we haven't done enough. And it's like there's obvious ones just sitting there. Uh, even on corporation tax, there's an argument that startup businesses shouldn't pay corporation tax for the first five years because if they make money in year, sorry, if they lose money in year one and year two and then make a bit in year three, why are they paying tax on that one? You know what I mean? Or, or, or they might go back into a negative position in year four because business is difficult. So for me, that's a big issue. There's just no nuanced thinking to how we can support Irish indigenous business. And it's a big challenge. Uh, I think the other, the other issue there is what's the incentive for somebody who's leading a large team in Google or Facebook, uh, extremely well paid and, you know, doing really, really well from their share options. What's the incentive for them to leave and start a business there Absolutely isn't none. There isn't none. one. On none. The giants, a lifetime yeah. of pain. It's, a, it's an act of lunacy, <laughs> yeah. right? It's yeah. an act of lunacy. Well, look, we'll stop it there before we talk every person in the country out of starting their own business. <laughs> Scaling support and a call to action, I think. No, is... we're saying go and do it and we'll, we'll work and Absolutely. we'll try and make sure the government listen to us. Yep. Perfect. Thank you guys so much. And of course, you're not going to go anywhere because we'll be coming back to you in just a few minutes for your one to watch for the week. Now, our next guest is busy enjoying a status that many startups can only dream of, that of the newly acquired. His gaming company, Digit, has just been bought by LA-based studio Scopely on the back of their overwhelmingly successful partnership on the game Star Trek Fleet Command. Our all-in trailblazer this week is Richard Barnwell. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And on an episode all about scaling, considering you've just scaled your way into an acquisition... There's no better place to start. Tell me about the acquisition. <laughs> exciting news. Thanks very much. Yeah, um, actually, it's been, it's been yeah, super exciting. It's actually been great this last few months. Um, I think unusual for a lot of companies is we had already been working very closely with our acquirer um, since about 2015. So um, we met Scopely uh, in, like I say, in 2015. Digit had been uh, around for about three years beforehand. Um, uh, it was, it's been uh, like a long time in the making. And we've been actually been operating like one business for a very long time, actually. We found that uh, kind of removing the barriers and, and becoming one team in building the game was much more successful. Um, so although there's been officially an acquisition for us, it was actually just a continuation of what we'd already achieved. Um, but obviously what's great now is obviously we've got the support of the, of the large organisation. Um, I get more exposure to other games and other dramas. Um, so yeah, no, thank you. That's, that's great. And uh, exposure to some significant and high-profile people and investors as well. I know that Scopely has connections with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Beats by Dre. Do you think this is going to open you up to a whole world of um, potential other, I suppose, I was going to say investors, but you've just been acquired, but, you know, other high-profile people who could help your career and help the company? Um, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that question, actually. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we, we have... I mean, Scopely as a business has, has raised you know, about $250 million from numerous high-profile kind of individuals as well as uh, venture capital companies. Um, the advantage of that, of course, is the amount is obviously the cash and capital to do big things is huge, but obviously the kind of the knowledge coming in is, is great. Um, for me personally, obviously I get exposure to the Scopely team in LA, which um, is like a who's who of Games Elite. So that in itself is actually super interesting. Mm. I haven't met those investors uh, yet, so I'm hopefully will do in the future, but actually... Uh, for the time being, it's just more enabling us to kind of uh, do big things. Um, but yeah, there, there is, I think as a business, um, Scopely is is positioned incredibly interestingly. Um, you know, it's based in LA, which I think is like a hotbed for for talent, but also for kind of creative industries. And I think you know it has history in doing movies. Now it's gone into games in a very big way. Um, and I think those celebrities, as well as kind of that level of investment, is just positioning Scopely to to achieve something quite special. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I don't, like I said, I don't, I don't know. The exposure to them isn't really something that I need to worry about. It's not something mm. that kind of is, is motivating me. But I think knowing that the company has that level of support, allowing us to take on big challenges inside our industry, that's that's pretty cool. I guess you're also joining a family with uh, a lot of strings to its bow beyond Star Trek Fleet Command. Can you tell us a little bit more about Scopely's um, big names that they've worked on, big games? Sure. So Scopely's a business. Um, is It's very international, so it's global. It has operations across... 
numerous countries, um, obviously headquartered in, in Los Angeles, uh, now with a big footprint in Barcelona. I think it's tripled the size in Barcelona, I think just announced that. Um, obviously us over here in Dublin, um, and it's just also announced this in going into APAC as well. I think that's about a week ago. Um, so big global business, uh, working with lots of big IP holders. So um, you're talking Warner Brothers, Sony, CBS, amongst others. Um, obviously, we just mentioned kind of the big kind of fundraise from capital giving exposure. And, and as part of that, it's built this really unique business model where um, it focuses on creating these game franchises. So these are the these are games across multiple genres, um, from puzzle and RPG to, to strategy. Mm. Um, and, it, and it's managed, you know, as a business, has managed to deliver, I think it's now six consecutive number ones. Um, which is unprecedented. I mean, it's, that's that's huge. Um, and numerous of them have kind of doing kind of significant revenue over a sustained period of time. Um, and that's it's not something is, is normal in any industry, uh, and especially across multiple dramas as well. I think that's um, that's a pretty unique position to, to be in. Um, and, and and that business, like I was mentioning earlier, it's, it's led by some incredibly talented and very experienced individuals who are very ambitious. And I think they've. Um, they're really pushing the limits of the industry. Um, and that for us is kind of uh, positioning us in a good place as well. Mm. And of those six, um, you know, six successes, um, I suppose, that they have under their belt, you guys were pretty instrument instrumental in one of those successes, Star Trek Fleet Command. I have to ask you about the, um, the double-edged sword of getting involved with a, a legacy franchise like that. Because on the one hand, of course, you've got the instant name recognition of Star Trek. Yeah. But on the other hand, you have to deliver or you're going to have fans around the world <laughs> ready, to, <laughs> ready to let you know yeah, that you, you failed. You absolutely do, yeah. yeah. Think, How do you handle that? I, I think um, the, the, the point we start at was excitement for the brand. So um, we, as a team, um, the team in Dublin, the team in L.A., team kind of creating the product absolutely loves Star Trek. There's, it's, whether there's um, a link because we work in games and it's a very kind of, uh, you know, it's a sci-fi brand. It's something we all grew up with. I mean, Star Trek's a 50-year-old brand, so we've all had exposure to it. So for the chance to actually get your hands on it and work with it in a, in a new way, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty inspiring and very exciting for the team. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's scary. I mean, you have to look after the brand in a certain way. You, like, there are millions of players who expect you to do certain things and treat it in a certain way. So we have to be really careful with the law, really careful with how we position a certain character or how we treat a certain race or a ship or whatever else. And on the flip side, we have to do it in a way which can be commercially successful. So we have to also embrace, we need to make some changes to what people understand to make it work in, in a free-to-play uh, games environment, which is what we focus on. Um, but what we did, we worked really closely with CBS, the license holder. Um, we have, you know, a big team um, across kind of the multiple locations trying to figure out how to make this work well. Um, and we took our time making sure that the the narrative and the story arc all works really well with with the player base. And then you know, we listen to our players as well. You know, it's been um, it's, it's a franchise we want to keep going for a very long time. So you know, we really want to see this in kind of five plus years still kind of doing as well as it's doing today, if not better. Uh, and that requires us to to really stay very close to the to the brand and, and be really true to Star Trek while also altering it in the places that makes sense, reimagining it for the new platform that it's on. Um, and did you have to deal with a lot of, uh, shall we say, backseat game designers? <laughs> uh, so we have a saying in the industry, everyone's a game designer and everyone's an artist. Nice. Um, and so a lot of that is, is ensuring that everyone understands the vision of what we're trying to build. We make that really clear and communicate that very clearly, um, especially to kind of the IP holder, make sure they understand where we're trying to take their brand, to make sure they're on board and they have a voice as well. So, you know, the, in the very early days, there's lots of pitches and presentations. There's, there's lots of, this is what we want to do and why, and does this make sense for everybody? Uh, lots of feedback. Um, and we put a lot of effort in the very beginning to get that right because then that allows us to go pretty quick through development. Mm. Um, but we also have a really close working relationship with, with the IP holder, which you have to do to ensure that um, you know, we don't misstep and, and we get it just right um, as much as possible. Um, but, uh, and but even outside the industry, I'd imagine there are a lot of people who play a lot of games and thus think that they could design games better than you guys could. Is that Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, the amount of times I, um, I mean, even, even on social media, we get messages, I've got a great idea for a game. Mm. So it's, 
that's kind of the world we live in. That's very, very common. Yeah. Um, I think lots of people have great ideas for games, but actually making them commercially successful is a, an entirely different challenge. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people underestimate the amount of work that goes into, into making games. Absolutely, um, yeah. The size of the teams, um, the depth of thinking we have to go the through. The duration. I'm always surprised to hear such and such a game was released. It's a huge success. It only took five years to develop. <laughs> it's yeah, staggering. I mean, yeah, I mean, the... the the length of development is, is pretty significant, but if you if you break it down to the component parts of, of when you're trying to create these products, which in, in our case, we call them MMOs, which is massively multiplayer online. And, and that means that we can sustain thousands of players in the same game experience. Well, that technically is an incredibly tough challenge. And then that's excluding the, the content you need to create, the artwork, the, the narrative, the mm. hundreds of thousands of words you need to write. Um, it's, they're, they're big, they're big undertakings. Um, and yet some console games um, have kind of notoriously been going for five, six, seven years. We're not a console game, we're kind of on mobile, so mm. we have a slightly kind of uh, shorter dev cycle. Um, yeah, and why mobile only, actually? I meant to ask you that. Uh, I was curious about that decision. Was there a reason? Yeah, well, so, so Scopely is, is a mobile gaming company. Oh, well, there you um, go. <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we believe that uh, it's a kind of a platform of choice right now. I mean, everyone has a mobile phone in their mm. pocket, pretty much. Um, from a global industry standpoint, give you an idea of scale, um, I mean, mobile gaming in 2018 did $68 million worth of revenue. Mm. Uh, sorry, $68 billion. The industry yeah. got $68 billion worth of revenue, which is larger than movies and music combined. It, it's really very significant, and it's growing at an incredible rate as well. With um, I think the New Zoo are predicting in 2021 that it's going to be worth $120 billion. So there is, there is a lot of commercial reasoning that we think mobile is it's a great platform. Um, and we also think for the kind of games we create, the fact it's always in someone's pocket. So mm. you know, they can jump in for a few minutes uh, on the commutes yeah. uh, when they're at home. And, and the devices are getting stronger and stronger, allowing us to do more visually impressive kind of games on mobile. So that was our first kind of you know function was to really get mobile just right. What it looks like for the future, of course, who knows? You know, the, the platforms are changing all the time. Something which we're doing as a business is, is always monitoring the new technology that's happening, where platforms are going. Um, and in a few years, we may look at kind of uh, expanding that more widely. But right now, mobile is our first platform of choice. And I think the numbers speak for itself. I think, like, mobile is dominating. Yeah. Um, well, in terms of those numbers and that figure you mentioned for 2021, um, I guess the whole gaming industry is either is or is on course to be um, probably the biggest industry in the world, full stop. Where would you see Ireland fitting into that and, and companies like yourself and the ecosystem here? And now that's a great question and, and hopefully it can play a bigger and bigger role. Um, I know when we first started Digit there was very little in terms of a games industry here in Ireland, um, which actually made it one of the most attractive locations because the talent was here, there just wasn't really a vehicle for that talent to express itself. Um, that's not the case today. Um, so obviously, kind of, um, you know, the kind of our operation is now pretty significant in central Dublin. Um, we now have numerous other companies kind of starting up, and um, I think that if actually, as of right now, there is actually a games conference going on in Dublin, which is is great to see. So, I would like to put some uh, like a friendly wager that within another four or five years we will not be the only major games developer in, in town okay. um, we're also seeing some really interesting stuff happening on the west coast there's um there's a game being developed out there right now which looks great um there's a few others kind of appearing so um, i'm pretty confident that we're going to see probably you know between the 30 to 50 other games developers within five years actually shipping titles mm. uh, and that's huge um i think ireland as well just as a country has the DNA to be a great games development country. Um, I mean, it's very strong technically, always has been. You know, there's a really big history of middleware technology, which is very similar to transferable skills. Great in art, great in animation. Um, I mean, the animation industry here has already proven itself. So would love to think that we've kind of been a bit of a catalyst for it. Um, but we will see. We're still, we're still very bullish about mm. the environment here. We're still growing here. Um, and do you think Brexit will help or hinder that the, evolution? The, the Brexit question, I mean... Yeah. I don't know. Um, at the moment, we're seeing it helping because we have an influx okay. of talent coming over from the UK who are nervous. Um, and, you know, this is kind of European kind of talent. So the European citizens that uh, are interested in staying with inside the EU zone, so they are naturally looking to come and uh, to move. And so right now we have an increased number of applicants for our roles coming over from the UK than we saw beforehand. What does that mean when the vote happens and where we'll actually be in six months' time? I think is anybody's guess. I think, you know, if if Brexit 
goes the way that kind of the media is predicting at the moment, which is the, is the hard exit. I'm not sure it's good or bad for anybody. Um, mm. But I am glad that our development operation is is here at the moment. But I, th I think it's just uncertainty. I think it, go, it could go either way. Um, and I don't think anyone can call it right now until the, uh, the certainty starts appearing. Okay, interesting. Uh, well, another thing I really was curious to ask you about uh, for all the gamers out there who may be watching, you develop some pretty successful uh, video games, but what about, what do you play? What, oh, do, you, what do you like in video games? Or? Um, so, I mean, I, I'm kind of, uh, so I'm a massive, you can probably guess this, before kind of games that we create inside, uh, inside the studio. I'm a huge strategy game fan. So um, if you ask most people that work in games, there'll be a childhood memory somewhere of like a game they played and mm. kind of it kind of... Uh, Something that drew, drew them in. Exactly. So for, for me, this was kind of, uh, there was a game back in the kind of the 90s called Command and Conquer. So for me, Command and Conquer was like one of my defining games. Um, so Command and Conquer and Age of Empires were these two really kind of meaty strategy games. And, and so mm. for me, if... If I've got downtime, the kind of games I'm playing are normally lightweight strategy games, right. normally on mobile, because I, I just find it so accessible. Um, mm. I've got family, I've got children, I don't have really the free time anymore to kind of spend hours in the evening on a console. So for me, having the ability to access something on the phone is, is kind of a big thing. So strategy games on phone is definitely where I spend most of my time from gaming. And the other one is I am, I am a little bit... I thoroughly enjoy some of the more casual kind of sports games. There's a few out there right now. There's a golf one that uh, I play very regularly. I actually, play really, I wouldn't have you down as a digital golf. A digital player. golfer. I am a digital. I, I try to be a physical golfer, but I'm not very good. I'm much better at the digital version, so I play digital golf, um, and there's a few others as well. But I, I think, mm. I think what I actually really like is it's so easy now just to try all these different sorts of player experiences. Yeah, you, you know, you're jumping on a plane. You can go on the app store. You can quickly download a game and play something different. So. Um, I would consume quite a lot of games. Um, some of it obviously is for industry research, but some of it is, is just uh, a bit of downtime. And what do you think about Fortnite? Do you have any particular opinions on that just since it's taken over the world? <laughs> <laughs> I think Fortnite was a, it was a really, really clever play mm -hmm. on, a, on a genre that's starting to appear. Um, the Battle Royale games have, as you say, they've kind of started to dominate um, massive, massive areas of kind of society. I've not played it personally. Mm. Um, I don't, I don't play um, FPSs anymore. Um, I have played some of the ones that are very similar, or some of the ones it's based on. Mm. Um, and I've watched a lot of kind of the Twitch videos to kind of understand exactly what's going on. But um, yeah, I, I wouldn't have a direct opinion on Fortnite as a whole, or FPSs in general, um, more than knowing that they exist and their market size. Um, Fair enough. We have a question that we always ask uh, some of our panel guests uh, on this show about their one to watch, uh, which, as the name suggests, is what they think is the one to watch in the coming weeks or months. And I'm curious, other than your own company, obviously, and your own work, would there be anything, any game um, emerging that you think would be the one to watch in the next six months, 12 months? Oh. Will there be a new Fortnite or a new World of Warcraft, you know, something that will capture everyone's attention? Um, that's a great question. Um, I'm putting you on the spot. I'm yeah, basically yeah, asking you, are, you to yeah. predict the future. So predict, don't worry. predict the future. Um, I don't know if there's, is there's a one to watch, but I think mm. the category that I'm quite interested in right now is that I think uh, we'll see more of. Um, it's not something we, where we operate, but there's a, we call it hyper casual. And these are games which don't take a huge amount of interaction, but... Uh, Get, get an awful lot of playtime, right. um, and we're seeing a lot of those kind of mechanics. Is that, the, is that like, you know, run your own farm, that type exactly of thing? Exactly that. Right, you okay. just hold the button down and stuff happens and you right. let it go, etc. So it's not something that we would ever go and build because uh, it's just not, it's not our bag. But um, definitely I've got some friends which are getting uh, quite excited about those. And now that you've got the acquisition behind you and you've got the huge success of Star Trek Fleet Command behind you, what is next for Richard Barnwell and for Digit generally? Yeah, I mean, I think... I mean, for us, the acquisition wasn't really, it wasn't really a change of business, if that makes sense. So for, for mm. us, when we, when we kind of, uh, when we were acquired or when we joined Scopely, I mean, like I say, we were kind of operating that way anyway. And, and kind of we had this vision of um, building kind of these, these large scale strategy games. And, and Digit's vision was always to do that. And so for us, it was actually, nothing's really changed from, from that mission. Mm. So for me, the only thing I can see happening for, for a long time ahead is, is on the same path. You know, we kind of, we're part of we're part of Scopely now officially, although we kind of felt like we were part of them beforehand. But we we are officially part of them. Um, my job, of course, is to, is to run the Digit Studio and, and to continue Star Trek and growing that as much as possible. And we don't build 
box products. So we don't build mm -hmm. them to ship and then sell. We build them for like like long term. So you know we, we are always talking about where how do we get this play? How do we grow this game for five years plus? And so for us, like that's our mission. Our mission is we've already built a, a really impressive product. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the biggest in the world right now. Um, and the question is how far we can take that in the next five years. So everything we're doing is orientated around achieving that outcome and achieving that goal. So uh, for for as far as I can see, and, and I know my team's the same, uh, is how big can we make Star Trek? That's, okay. I'll we'll have to check back in it. with you in 2024 to see. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's... Um, it's uh, it's been a, been a vision for a long time, and mm -hmm. I think I think you know with the, the side effect of having a long dev cycle is when you focus on something for such a long time, you really need to keep going. You still really want it to um, reach its full potential, and we're still on that curve. We haven't reached that potential yet. You're fully invested, all in. You might say. Oh, we are absolutely all in. Okay, well, congratulations on the acquisition, Richard, and I'm sure we won't be. This isn't the last we're going to hear from you anyway. Thank you very much. Richard Barnwell there, exciting stuff from him and lots more to come in the weeks and months ahead. But we're still in studio here with Brian and Niall who are going to give us their one to watch what's big in business at the moment for you. Yeah, so we've thankfully we've, we've calmed down slightly, but we're, um, we're genuinely two passionate guys in terms of like what needs to be done. So I'm going to take my lead in terms of what we've spoken about today and talk about two chaps who have an operation down in Clarenbridge and Galway who are a little bit like the idea I had in 2014, so they do a thing called Clean Cut Meals. They're scaling quite quickly, organically. Now, they're probably at that juncture where they need to move into uh, a new market, but they're selling about 14,000 meals, which is like essentially, you know, you know, there's lots of different ways to look at how people kind of can eat well and eat properly. So these guys operate quite you know, nicely on this kind of controlled calorie consumption. So they send people their set amount of meals for the week, People buy them, uh, they sign up on the website and they, they buy them in advance. And I just thought it was a really, really good operation. I think they were doing about 8,000 meals a week about six months ago. They're up to 14,000 in Ireland in a small market. I think London is calling there. I think they've, that's just a, you know, a very big market for them where people are very aware of you know, people who are on the go, moving quickly, don't necessarily always have time to prep their own meals, but want to eat good quality stuff. So they're an interesting business. I went and met the two guys and I think that um, I was just impressed with the operation. They want to run it from Galway, which is, again, refreshing. They want to be able to take on the world from there, and there's no, there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to. We, we need to create scenarios where they can. But yeah, that, to me, is my one to watch. So I'm, okay. I, my, my obvious one, the last time was Cali Cali, who've just now come out. The guys from Fulfill with their new product. So I'm still in the... I'll move past the food yeah. space. You like the food market a lot, don't <laughs> I you? I do, I do. I'm not alluding to something in the future, yeah. but I do, yeah. So there you go. They're my ones, because I met them recently. I was just really impressed with what okay, they're doing. Yeah. And what about yourself, Brian? Uh, mine is a, little, a much less po positive story. So my one to watch is WeWork. WeWork were forced to postpone their IPO for at least several months, essentially after investors had said no to a 65 billion valuation, no to a 45 billion valuation, no to a 20 billion valuation. Oh um, but I think the story goes further than just WeWork itself. I mean, WeWork was planning to raise a total of ten billion between equity and additional debt. Mm. It needs that money, and and I think the future of WeWork is definitely uh, in question now. Uh, but there's also the possibility that they will bring down SoftBank, who are the largest venture capital firm in the world, and had committed about $10.7 billion to, uh, to WeWork. And that's going to have knock-on knock on impact. Yeah. SoftBank power. Uh, Absolutely. Everything. They, they, they do indeed. And, and it, it'll also start, it'll start to make it harder to raise these huge mega funds, not just for SoftBank, but for other firms as well. And it'll also start to impact on the terms that are offered to other entrepreneurs. Investors will start to become a little bit more focused on protecting the downside risk to their capital. So, you know, potentially lower valuations and, and terms that are designed to, 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 to cover that downside risk. So I think this could have a lot of knock-on implications. Quick follow-up question there. Do you think this is a WeWork-specific problem or could this be a problem that would seep across all 
of the shared workspace culture that's popped up in recent years? So actually, I think in terms of the shared workspace uh, market, it's primarily a WeWork problem. You know, there are other businesses in the space that are profitable. Um, quite a lot step of, in here. Uh, yeah. of relatively small businesses, but also some big international businesses that are profitable but have hadn't kind of achieved the kind of crazy valuation level that yeah. uh, that that, that WeWork had, and you know that's that's one of the challenges. I mean, WeWork last year turned over one point eight billion and lost two billion. You know, you you've got to believe with a with a business like that that you're going to get to a point where you totally dominate a market and you can kind of set your own margins. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think that the shared workspace uh, business is that type of market. Yeah, and because that actually brings us back to the you know the interesting point we were chatting about in terms of scaling, right? So. We're all about like knowing when is the next stage or when is the next level. So, but if we go back to this culture that has been created, that entrepreneurs need to be mindful of, of VC funding. VC funding at its basis is based on the idea of outlandish projections to get as big a check as you can at as early a possible juncture in your journey. The huge downside to that then is when you get the check, you've got to go and spend it. So it automatically creates a scenario where your operating costs, your running costs are very, very high. So if we talk smaller levels, you could be a business in UK or France that is costing, sorry, you're turning 20 million quid a year and you're losing 5 million. There's a very good opportunity, or this, my, my proof would be, or my belief would be that there's businesses who could go the other way at it, turn 20 million and operate the exact same business for 15. But because you've got such a big check coming out of venture capital, which is again based on let's go as outlandish as we can, you end up in a scenario where you could forever end up losing money because your projections were too big, you got too much money, you've had to spend too much money. So it's a very, very important lesson for entrepreneurs. And the WeWork thing is at this huge global multi-billion pound scenario. However, there is huge lessons in that for Irish businesses in that that is the danger, that if you get a, raise a huge amount of capital, which, you know, good luck to everyone that's doing it, um, you've got to be make sure that you're not overspending. You don't end up in the best office because you had to spend the money. You don't end up with 100 staff too many because you've had to spend the money. So it's a really important point and it ties back nicely to the, to the, to the challenges and, and question marks around scale and when to scale. Mm. And that let's just, you know, let's try, I still believe there's a, there's a lot of room for businesses that want to get to X and Y in a sustained controlled market. Because the one thing I will say is the only benchmark of success in business is sustained profitability in the long term. Not how much you've raised at X, Y, and Z juncture. That so is take that your is time. Think about it. And that's the really only sure. at the end of it. That's that's what everyone who you're raising capital on behalf will want. So like you can't just get into a scenario where people are just raising capital and thinking they're being successful. And the ha we have seen that startup culture uh, really creep in from Silicon Valley and into Ireland and into Europe. And we, you need to be careful that like. You, you might make a profit every single year, but ultimately over a 10 year period, sustainable profit is what every business is looking for. Not how many, how much did you raise? And I think we work, if that does happen, and Brian is much closer to this tonight, if that does happen, uh, looking at it from a distance, I can see that that la la land that, has, that, that this kind of culture creates is going to implode and was going to implode. So let, let's just wait and see. And hopefully that, you know, job losses are minimized, but ultimately there's a massive calling card for ridiculous valuations built on, built on sand. Yeah, knock, knock on effect for sure and lots to consider there. I think we're going to have to have both of you back for a second session on scaling because I feel <laughs> we barely scratched the surface and there's so much more there. Thank you so much for being with us and for your very interesting one to watch choices. Thanks That's so it for this episode and thanks for being with us. And thanks to our partners in AIB for backing all in. Now, in next week's episode, we'll be talking about selling your product. Once you've got something you're pretty confident customers will want to buy, how do you manufacture just the right amount? How do you get it onto the shelves? And most importantly, how do you get it to fly off the shelves? Well, we're hoping that the skin nerds Jennifer Rock and Strong Roots founder Samuel Dennigan will be able to shed some light on that for us. While in the Trailblazer hot seat, we have high-flying tech entrepreneur Noel Morin. In the meantime, you can, of course, contact us by using the hashtag AllInBusiness and please subscribe so that you never miss an episode.